stuff you don't know about Rob Moore, apparently. I'm here with Kurt and Di. They have the Back to Business podcast. They're really successful entrepreneurs. You should definitely follow their show, the Back to Business podcast. And I asked them, what are you going to interview me about today? Stuff people don't know about Rob Moore. There we go. <laughs> So um, if you're a follower of my work, you're probably going to learn some stuff. In fact, Kurt said, we don't want all your backstory. I've heard that a thousand times. So, <laughs> um, Kurt, I, over to you. Thanks for interviewing me for your brilliant Back to Business podcast. I'm all yours. Okay, thank you, Will. So, hi, Kurt here. And I'm Di. Welcome to the Back to Business podcast. Our special guest today is best-selling author, multimillionaire, world record holder, podcaster, and co-owner of the UK's largest property training company, Progressive Property. And he's certainly passionate, flamboyant, and relentless. He's one of the UK top influencers and mentor to entrepreneurs and celebrities alike. Welcome to the show, the disruptive entrepreneur himself, Mr. Rob Moore. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Rob. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so yes, as you alluded to in the intro, um, we don't want to delve too much into the backstory because you've done thousands of interviews in the past and everyone asks you, you know, a little bit about the history. Um, obviously, you, you go on about your father and the incident outside the pub. Sometimes you're talking about the, the battles with weight as a, as a, as a, in your youth, I say. Um, but it's fair to say from our perspective in 2005, you went through a bit of a metamorphosis um, and seemed to reinvent yourself. So was the Rob that we know and love now, was that always in you, just fighting to get out? Yeah, my dad raised me to be an entrepreneur probably by age six. I was working in his pub. I, I, um, we were at a casino a couple of days ago for my friend's 40th birthday. And a guy said, if you can work out this um, equation in under three seconds, I'll give you some extra money. And he told me and I worked it out and everyone was like, what? <laughs> and then, you know, I'm not actually mega at maths, but my dad got me counting money, taking the money for the for the till off the customers age six. I was yeah. bottling up and emptying the pool tables and the fruit machines age six. Wow. So um, I looked, at, I, look, I mean, that'd probably be illegal now, but back then it was fine. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I am um, really looked up to my dad. I still do love. He always had loads of cash in his pocket. He'd go to auctions and buy all the equipment for his new pubs and bars and hotels and clubs. And he'd negotiate and haggle. And I was like, dad, dad. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was in me, I think, from an early age. But then I got stuck in the school system, you know, GCSEs, A-levels, university, um, do what you're told, go down this system, get a job. You should, you know, yeah. intelligent people go to university, get your degree, you know, build a career. And nothing wrong with that if you want to be a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, etc. But I didn't know what I wanted to be. And I, and I probably went down the wrong road. Um, and then finished uni, had a load of debt, as we all do. But isn't it really a, like not such a good thing when you get in a load of debt, but you still don't know what you want to do with your life? And that was me at age 23. Mm -hmm. I worked in my dad's pub because he was not very well for um, what was going to be a month before I decided what I was going to do. And it ended up being three years. I'd racked up more debt. And that got me to 2005. So um, I think in me was entrepreneurship. But um, I was also not very good with conflict. I was quite... Um, I wouldn't say shy, but I'd say I didn't have the courage to do things that made me uncomfortable. So I'd always hold myself back. You know, was when that people. The weight, Rob, would you say? Was that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was the fattest kid in my year and I learned to cope um, and, and sort of not be ostracized by everyone mm. by finding a way to get on with everyone by being non confrontational and sort of morph myself to be like them and ag agreeable so that people wouldn't reject me. Um, but in business, that's just, that just kills you. You can't be a walkover. You can't just sort of avoid conflict in business. Otherwise, you you just get eaten and bullied. Yeah. So I had to unlearn that again. I, it's weird. As a fat kid, I learned that as a way to cope at, at school and get on with people and not feel such an outsider. And then I had to unlearn it all to deal with challenge and conflict and critics and trolls and haters and staff and customers and all the other things we have to deal with. Yeah. So... Like I know you, and I think all your, your listeners know you. You're so passionate, and you're always on it, like like this. Were you like that as a child, or were you? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Did you grow to be who you are, or were you like that as a child? You were constantly on it, or trying to find new things, and and if that makes sense. Boundless energy, I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you wouldn't know this, and I didn't tell you before we started, but I was absolutely knackered before I started this podcast. Um, I, I had a really late night at a 40th birthday. I don't drink. It's not about drink, but I had a really late night, and I don't normally do that because I really need the sleep mm. and the routine. Yeah. yeah. And yesterday and today I've been battered. But as soon as you put the camera on or, you know, I knew that I was doing this podcast with you, I'm able to switch it on as soon as it's yeah. time to talk to, I mean, I've been in a board meeting for five and a half hours. Um, and, you know, I've got to make about 15 calls and speak to you and do a podcast room at 6.30 p.m. But I'm inspired to do those things. So I don't let my brain go to the point where I go, I don't want to do this. I've got to cancel this. You know, I much prefer it to being bored as well. So, no, I wasn't yeah. always like this because – I think when you are inspired to do something, I'm inspired to help as many people on this planet start and scale their business and get better financial knowledge. I'm inspired to do that, whether that's through books or podcasts or breaking world records for public speaking or having training companies or buying real estate or whatever. I'm inspired to do that. So even when I'm tired, I can turn it on because I'm inspired to do it. But when you're not inspired to do something, even when you're energized, it can kill you and, and just sap your energy. So no, I wasn't always like this. Um, but when you find something to do that you love, I think people are always asking me, Rob, where do you get your energy from? Yeah. Like, yeah. Doing what I love and loving what I do. That's where I get yeah. my energy. It's not a secret supplement or mm. it's not that I'm necessarily any more vital than any other human being. But if you study the people who love what they do and do what they love, they work to two or three in the morning often and don't even see it as work. Like imagine a kid on a PlayStation going at 7 p.m. Oh, I'm knackered. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, this is not gonna happen, they just came through the night and they love yeah. it. Yeah. So the, the key for energy and always being able to turn it on when the cameras are on or the you need to have a meeting is merging your passion profession, loving what you do and doing what you love. So I guess yeah. it's no different from being like an elite athlete, let's say, because we oh, interview Curtis Smith. Yeah, Thank but no, but, no, no, no. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> it's just from a business perspective. Because we interviewed Curtis Mitchell on our podcast, and the guy is 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 enthusiasm, and he's and he's going to make it happen. It was all the time on the podcast, and you're the same, mm. right? But you're doing it from a business and entrepreneur perspective. Yeah, well, look, I suppose when you're an athlete, you know, your diet and your exercise and your actual physical energy is really important because that fraction of a second. For me, I get the physical energy through the enthusiasm, the energy and the passion. So, you know, I, I can get it even when I haven't eaten. I can get it when I haven't trained. I can get it when I haven't slept much. It's like, I suppose it's a channeling in a way. Um, I, I couldn't say where from, but it does tend to give me energy, but it's more mental than physical. Sure. Mm. Whereas an athlete, I think you'd need the physical element as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned about education and you were privileged to go to a, a private school and by I your own admission. It's a freaking waste of my dad's money. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and you and you and I, I read somewhere in one of your books, you know, you didn't you didn't make you know, you didn't mix with the rich kids, let's say. So if you knowing what you know now, how would you have mm. been if you went to private school now as that young child? Would you have mixed with them? Would you behave differently? Yeah, I'd have tapped up all the rich kids' sons and got to know the rich kids' dad and gone into business. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, work, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah um, but yeah, I, I I wasn't that aware when I was a young kid. Um, but def I mean, Mark was. Mark definitely was playing that game in his sort of um, really early teens even. I, I was not that aware. Um, mm. But yeah, that's probably what I would do now. Um, and or hang around with the kids who are interested in sort of starting and setting up their own business and almost forming sure. a little mastermind. Like you hang around with all the people who are in the sports team or the chess club or whatever. Yeah. You, you know, if I could have found a few people that were interested in being enterprising mm. and entrepreneurial, but I wasn't one of the reasons, you know, you said I was fortunate enough to go to private school. It all depends how you look at it. Cause if I'd have gone to public school, I'd have had a bit, bit more street smarts, probably. Sorry. Yeah. 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 State exactly. school. yeah. I'd have had yeah. a bit more street smarts a bit earlier. I was protected in some ways. Although I did make the decision to leave at, um, after GCSE and go to a state school. And that definitely taught me to be a bit more streetwise, a bit wily, spot mm. people who would maybe screw you over and stuff like yeah. that. You, know, you, got, you, got, you can't rely on the teachers because they're, they're just not there. Um, whereas, you know, you always know you're safe with the, with the teachers. Um, so I've got, I've got the experience of both. Um, like I said, if you want to be a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer and the traditional education where going to a certain red brick school or university is important, that's the road. I'm not the one that says, you know, school and university are 
uh, of a losers or a wrong like some people do. Yeah. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, a disruptive entrepreneur, if you want to be enterprising, creative in the in in the sense of, of business, um, I, I think you, you get the wrong traits knocked into you and you get the right traits knocked out sure. of you. So, yeah, I mean, that was actually one of the questions I had. Would you say that from an entrepreneurial perspective, traditional education route is probably not conducive to um, certainly entrepreneurial success? Not when I went to school. Mm. Now, you know, schools might have modernized or there might be more specialist business schools. But when yes. I went when I went to university, my tutor teaching architecture didn't even have an architect's practice. And there wasn't one single module in three years about generating leads or clients or sales or marketing. It was yeah. all about designing buildings. And that's fundamentally wrong because part of being an architect is winning clients and, you know, maybe even setting up your own practice one day. So that was definitely wrong for me. And, and, and for sales and marketing is one thing, but managing emotions in business, the, the, the concept of a mastermind, feeling lonely and you know, de dealing with rejection and criticism and taking risks and all those kind of things, which are absolutely vital lessons in entrepreneurship. No, I wasn't taught any of that at school, any of it. So, yeah. yeah I don't think they they do now, <laughs> to be honest. But yeah, yeah, well, we've set up an entrepreneur's business academy, um, which is like a replacement of an MBA. Get an EBA, not an MBA. And things like managing your emotions and dealing with risk and criticism and challenge and defamation and you know people going for you publicly and um, the th these things aren't usually taught. You know, you're taught about management accounts and reading a balance sheet and profit and loss and financial reporting and controlling and all of that. And, and that's one part of it. Um, negotiation. I don't know how much that's taught in the real world. Um, cre you know, creating campaigns, marketing in the, yeah. you know, you, you students of direct marketing. I know you guys, well, as am I, I mean, I can't imagine a university teaching direct response marketing. Oh no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shit now. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you kind of mentioned it before. So, you know, you, you're in a, 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 I think, you know, your father's entrepreneurial and you, and you, and you were entrepreneurial being with your father, right? If you hadn't had that, do you think you would still be mm. an entrepreneur here today? I'm going to be straight up with you, Di. I don't know how relevant a question that is. And here's why. You could have gone back through my life, life and changed a million things and it would have changed my destiny. Sure. Um, and you could create a false environment if I hadn't, if I'd have, if my dad had been Bill Gates, you know, would I be a billionaire? Maybe, maybe not. So um, I don't know is the honest answer because I can't sure. create a parallel, a parallel universe where, and I don't say this to say that wasn't a good question. I say this to answer the question honestly. Mm. You know, my dad at times really gave me, probably even inadvertently, some scenarios and situations and upbringing that, that was conducive to being entrepreneurial. At times, he also did the opposite, it, uh, you know, unwittingly when he was trying to protect me. Um, really, what I, I'll, I'll just be straight up. The, the main reason I started a business was because my dad had a massive nervous breakdown and I felt like a fucking failure. And I felt like I was a big part of that. And he, mm. you know, he'd done a lot for me and I was lazy and complacent and scared and, you know, not comfortable, but not uncomfortable enough. And I, I left. I walked from my pub to my house, which was next door, and decided to be an artist because I didn't know what else to do, and I was scared. Um, yeah. And so I was scared into taking action. And artist became. Then I worked in a property company, and then we set up Progressive. So um, I've learned. A, I've learned a lot more in the last fifteen years than I did in the first twenty-five. Get I think it. Self, self education has definitely been massive for me, um, yeah. as as well as my dad's upbringing but what i wouldn't anyone i wouldn't want anyone listening to think oh well yeah rob had a, a dad who you know raised him to be an entrepreneur so yeah it was all right for him or i couldn't replicate that yeah didn't dad didn't teach me about negotiation dad didn't teach me about selling dad didn't teach me about hiring or recruitment um that i just watched the dad be a hustler sure yeah um, good answer probably, yeah. i like your answer bit, rob what, what does your dad think about what you've achieved I mean, um yeah well he's talking about it like, He's told me twice in 15 years that he's proud of me, and that's twice, two times I'll cherish for the rest of my life, and that's good enough. Yeah, um, yeah I think. Um, yeah, I think he thinks I've done good. Good. That's good. That's great. But he doesn't, you know, like I said, twice in 15 years telling me, "Come on, Dad, 
fuck's sake. Yeah. You know, that's, 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 you the same that's problem, Daniel, yeah. exactly the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, you did pick up another interesting skill in your yeah. youth, um, having obviously spent a lot of time in pubs, as you mentioned. And uh, we heard you're quite a good uh, pool player. Out of interest, you're probably aware we, we had Kevin McDonald on the show and um, we had to ask in a game of pool, who, who, who would win, Rob Moore or Kevin? What, what's well, your Kevin answer? Had, Kevin was like fourth or fifth in Ireland, I think. Yeah. And Kevin yeah. And I, yeah, Kevin and I have played each other quite a lot and um, I've beaten him more than he's beaten me. So that's the fact. I, I don't. Uh, know. He, he didn't tell us that. No, he we're, didn't we're tell us that. Yeah. No. So he gave you conjecture. I gave you fact. Um, <laughs> and 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 Rusty is you know unpracticed and rusty. And yeah, I, I took him out more often than not. And yeah, I mean, I was six, seven years old beating adults at pool. I, I beat the um, the Cambridgeshire champion. I bet him fifty quid when I was a kid. I, I beat him right. nine. I beat him nine one, and then he said, "I'm not fucking paying you," and walked out. So that was, <laughs> yeah, that's a good lesson in life. If you bet for fifty quid, I mean fifty quid when you're what? I was fifty six, six yeah, fifteen, sixteen. That's a lot, that's a lot right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you put it on the table. You, you've yeah. got to see the readies. You put it on the table. You got to um, see it through. But yeah, beating the the the, the, the Cambridgeshire champion nine one was pretty good. So yeah, I mean. You know, I'm better than him, and he knows it. And he's <laughs> well, as, as I said to Kevin, don't, don't worry because Rob won't be listening. Yeah. <laughs> facts are facts. Facts yeah. are facts. Um, you mentioned Mark. So Mark Home is your business partner, and you met him back in 2005. If I'm right, yeah. if you had, if you hadn't met him, do you think you would have been on a completely different journey? So I guess what impact has Mark had? <laughs> this is the parallel had universe answer, yeah. isn't it, Rob? This is another one yeah. of, oh, that's a rubbish, a rubbish question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if Arnold Schwarzenegger was my dad, I'd probably be a bit more muscly. So, <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's, of course, meeting Mark has had a massive impact in my business and financial life. Yeah. And, you know, he's a very much, I mean, this watch here, which is a lot of money, I don't know, 30 grand plus. Um, Mark just WhatsApp me 15 minutes ago, just before this. And he said, Rob, I've got something that y y you'll really want. And he brought my watch, which I'd left in a meeting room. So Ooh. I'm the kind of oh, guy wow. to take a watch off and stick it on the table. And I left it in the meeting room and I'd have lost it. And Mark's the guy that brings it back and says, yeah. Rob, wow. you, you probably want that. He's, <laughs> he's careful, analytical, tactical, smart, financial, operational, legal. He's all the things I'm not. And yeah. we make a great partnership. And, yeah, there, there'd have been more chaos in my life without him, for sure. Um, and I was on a trajectory downwards. And how much further would I have gone down had I not met him? I don't know. But I definitely mm. didn't have the skills or resources required. And I hadn't really met anyone who was a, um, a peer that would inspire me to greater things. So had I not met him, might I have met someone else like him? Possibly. Maybe. Yeah. 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 We'll never know. You might took the I... opportunity, but... Um, yeah. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> that book opportunity make sure you buy that yeah, yeah. <laughs> i've got a few spare copies if you want them <laughs> all right don't talk like this yeah. <laughs> so obviously you've had great success over the last 15 years um where, where does your ed well endless motivation yeah. come from and and what keeps you going because you've achieved so much what, what is it that gets you out of bed every day so you continue to do what you do i love doing a deal I love coming up with an idea that gets executed. I love coming up with an idea and everyone else thinking it won't work and then going and making it work. I had one of those um, in the gym yesterday morning and I pitched it to my team and the most of them were like, nah, nah. So that just made me want to do it even more. So I will do it. <laughs> um, look, I'm still motivated a bit by being the fat kid in the school or, you know, my dad's breakdown and wanting to make him proud, stroke, do something with my life. I'm definitely still motivated by those things. I love the I love the smell and feeling of progress. You, you know, you, you're you're a bit better today than you were yesterday. You get some shit ticked off the list. You you make some stuff happen. You move forward. You grow. I love that feeling. I'm a, I'd say I'm addicted to that, oh. um, which is also problematic. I mean, 
it means that you don't rest very well. It means that you're not very good bored. It means that you don't take much time off or you have FOMO when you're doing nothing because you feel like you could be doing more. Yeah. So, you know, every, everything can be a double-edged sword. But, um, yeah, there's some of the things that motivate me. I, I definitely, as I get more and more experience helping other people and seeing them succeed, I love doing nice, random – I'm not going to list them out because I want to – Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not here to brag, but I do a lot of things for other people, which really um, – makes me feel really good that I'm contributing. Mm -hmm. I like feeling valuable, useful to people. The fact that, you know, people think, yeah, you know, I can learn from Rob or he inspires me or he motivates me or um, that makes me feel valuable. So, yeah, all those things, you know. So I, they're, I mean, they're your kind of rewards, I guess, aren't they? Because that's how you're rewarding yourself to keep going. Is that oh, I, love, I love spending money as well. So, um, yeah, I just spent five grand in McQueen yesterday. And, uh, yeah, as, as you know, I've got a, quite a few expensive cars and, a lot of expensive watches and I've got a quarter of a million pound hi-fi and I've got a nice big um, expensive house. Although if you put it in London, it'd be 20 million. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about that because most people are like, oh, well, you know, it's not all about the money. Um, everyone who's everyone I've ever heard who says oh, it's not about the money is skin. I have yeah. never heard a billionaire say it's not about the money. You know, when everyone, you know, when people say money doesn't make you happy. I've never heard a billionaire say that. I've never heard a billionaire say, do you know what, Rob? I'm so fucking unhappy in my billions. Just take it all. Have it all. I don't want it. Baby. I'm so unhappy. So mon money is definitely a motivator. Now, it's a motivator for keeping score and making progress. But, yes. You know, I love going to London and buying some cool shit. And it make, yeah. and it's the reward for what you do. And and I like buying I'm, – I bought one of my friends, Ed, two pairs of Louboutin shoes. And that just felt really good. And if you're skint, you can't do that. So never let anyone tell you that money is not a motivator. It's a motivator. Just don't make it the single obsessive motivator. Exactly. If I can jump to a question, is that why you're so, you, you love watches so much? Because I know you've got an expensive watch on, on your wrist. Is, is one of the reasons you like them is because you can actually see it and it kind of reminds you, do you know what? I am bloody good and I'm doing a great thing. And, and that reminds me of, and to keep me going on what I'm doing. Yeah, so there's a few reasons. Um, I don't know why, but I just always love watches as a thing. Like, you know, you might love vinyl or you might love classic cars or um, you might love fashion or you might love architecture. I just always love watches. And for like 10 years straight, I wanted a Daytona because to me that was just the, um, you know, the, the apex, the apogee, mm. the pinnacle of uh, watches. And then when I got my first one and the experience of doing it, I just got hooked on that. Um, and I just decided I'm going to be a watch collector and buy loads of watches. And I buy watches as a reward. So I don't just go and buy watches for the sake of it. Yeah. I, I buy loads of Richard Meal and Patek Philippe today. But for me, it's like, okay, create this campaign or solve this problem or do this deal and then go and get yourself a Patek Philippe or a Richard Meal or Rolex or um, all the other quirky brands that I like. Um, I, I like a watch because it's the only piece of jewelry that I wear. And so I feel like, you know, ladies who like jewelry like them for whatever reason they like. But, you know, I'm, I'm not into one earring or a necklace or anything <laughs> like that. It's just I'm not knocking that. You know, some, it looks cool on some people. It's just not me. So this is my only piece of jewelry. And, and it's jewelry is a nice thing. It's yeah. a reward. But also I learned to make money out of them. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good too. answer. Yeah. Every, yeah. every single watch I've sold, I've made really good money on. So basically, I get paid to own 30, 50, 100 grand watches, which is pretty cool. And Mark, mm -hmm. you know, all right, look, I learned about watches, but Mark taught me about not buying liabilities and understanding the best point in their cycle to buy them and let them go down in value. You know, this quarter of a million pound hi-fi that I've got that I've built up over time, um, I, every time I've traded in, I've either got my money back or um, yeah. made money in some instances. I made two grand on my last pair of speakers, a um, Paid, paid seven for a pair of 12 grand speakers, sold them for nine. So I got paid two grand to own a pair of yeah. grand speakers. I bought these. Always hustling. Yeah, I bought these Wilsons. They're 45 grand, but I didn't pay 45 grand. And um, if I traded them in, I'd probably just about get my money back. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's the deal. It's the hustle. It's the feeling of, yeah, I'm enjoying that, but I'm not losing money on that. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, the McQueen stuff I got was in the 40% VIP sale. So five, five grand instead of eight and a half grand. Now, if I'd have paid eight and a half grand, it's immediately worth five grand. So I, I do like that. And I learned that from Mark and, and, and I'll always be grateful to him for that. But I, I always feel like I'm using money well if I'm not just spraying it around. You know, th this watch I bought, it's a 
500 piece limited edition. It might even be less. And I bought that second hand. Um, and if I sold it, I'd make money on it. And yeah. all, all, all the Daytonas I bought, it just keep going up and up and up and up and up. And I'll haggle like crazy to buy a watch. I'm, I'm not <laughs> I haggle like crazy. I never buy any on, on eBay. I always haggle like crazy because it just feels good to get a deal. Yeah. So, yeah, you, know, you're waste, you're, you know, you're not wasting money all yeah. the time. Yeah. Just out of interest, you mentioned, obviously, you got that from Mark. What it, to, uh, A reciprocal kind of question. What do you think in return you've given to Mark? Personality? <laughs> 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 nah, oh, no. that's cool. Mark's lovely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it was a joke. Um, yeah, yeah Mark, Mark's got a brilliant personality and brilliant sense of humour when you get to he know him. He's so you're... intelligent. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. that guy is unbelievable. And, he, and again, when we interviewed him on the podcast, Rob, uh, something i hadn't realized he never gives up he, he, he gets he gets all this shit thrown at him and he yeah. just sits there and figures it out right yeah. yeah and just keeps going he, and i don't think people see that they say oh well you've got da, da, da. no that guy is constantly figuring out prob you know getting problems and figuring it out and, and having solutions yeah and he loves that uh, i mean part of him it frustrates him but he loves that so i mean look you know really maybe you should ask him but I mean, I know the answer because he's told me and various people over the years, but um, I got him into running and health and fitness, which is a big part of his life. I'd bang on his door at 6 a.m. every morning. In that first year, we were getting to I know him. I bet he loved you for that. Well, <laughs> he does. Like, yeah. Running is the, one of the biggest parts of his life. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, he, I, I learned sales. I learned marketing, which is not really Mark's drive or passion or desire. So mm. I was really grateful that I did that. I do all the public speaking, the personal brand, which... I think he likes me doing because it's not his bag. So I guess I'm just a good foil. I guess I've developed a set of skills which are complementary to his. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I do think he thinks that when I get my mind on something, I'm pretty relentless, um, which Mark is the same, by the way, in just in yes. this type of um, activity. So, and, and, yeah. and you've been saying how, how relentless you are and, and how you keep no, going. No, no, you, you said that, not me. You said that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, you know, you keep going, right? You never stop. Right. Honestly, Rob, there must be a day when you've woke up and thought, I just can't be bothered. You must, you must, like, as all human beings, just to, to help us out out there, because we see you all the time and you're so, you are great at what you do. But there must be the odd day we think, I can't be bothered. It, it, yeah. that, that must have happened. And, and if you could, you know, elaborate on that and what you did to get over that. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, not that much. Uh, I'm, I'm not one for bragging for bragging's sake. So there's a lot of things that people don't know about me that I don't even say that are probably more credible sure. than the things that you hear. But um, I just, I'm going to give you an honest answer because that's what you want. You don't want me to fluff yes. it. I could, say, I could say, yeah, I feel like I don't feel like it a lot. And, you know, don't worry, it's normal. No, most of the time I don't have that problem. And I'll tell you why, because I'm doing something I'm meant to do. I've yes. got, yeah. I it's mean, like a calling, isn't it? Yeah, it's that, yeah. but it's also, I've got responsibilities, a lot of them, you know, I've got a lot of staff and I've got, um, you know, meaningful, I've got a foundation and, and a meaningful mission. So, um, so I get short term, like I can't be bothered to do this right now or, um, mm. You know, I, I feel fatigued in this moment, but I'm pretty good at having a word with myself. Yeah. So I was, I was in a board meeting. It was it was five hours in that I could see my whole the whole board were like, I'm so knackered and over this. I pushed them hard. I pushed and pushed and pushed. And I'm like, it's two o'clock. I've had about 40 applications for my brand and marketing mastermind. I've got the um, podcast with you guys at three. I've got the clubhouse room at. 6 30 i'm you know I'm, I'm in a bit of sleep debt because i stayed up till 2 a.m for this birthday party and momentarily i thought oh if i just i could just cancel the podcast and could just let the, <laughs> place in the clubhouse room momentarily that came into my head unconsciously okay. because i was really tired and i thought no you know diane kurt you, you know they're really loyal clients they're friends i'm not letting them down don't care what happens and i can bang it i can get three of these calls in before um the podcast probably will be 45 minutes on the on the podcast i'll go i'll go out on a walk that'll energize me i'll smash out about five or ten calls and i'm just good at having a word with myself yeah and um you know i feel more energized now and i was knackered before we got on and i did those three calls and the last one finished at 59 past the hour and i got on bang on the hour so if i ever feel like that 
I'm pretty good at having a word with myself and mm. just knowing that it's temporary, like at sort of 7.30 tonight, I can just go to bed and tomorrow morning I'll be fucking on it again. Um, so honestly, no, I don't, I very rarely feel like um, you, not doing it, not not doing what needs to be done. Now I tell you something I think people do because I, I sense this and I have to control my emotions doing this. So um, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday morning, it was Ed. And we were talking about something and we, we got some challenges going on in our business and we're having a little bit of a purge or a change, a bit of a shake up. We do that every two or three years. It's really fucking important to do, but it's messy when you do it. Mm. I was talking to Ed about a few of those things and he's like, oh, how do you feel about that? And in the moment I thought, oh man, I feel a bit shit about that. But I didn't. I felt tired because I had a late night. Mm. So what I was able to do is go, well, I actually don't know, Ed, because I feel tired because I had a late night now. And I don't want to make that make everything. So what people do is there's one bad thing that happens and then everything yeah. is fucking ruined because of that one bad thing. Yeah. yeah. And I think what I've learned to do is go, wait a minute, I'm tired. That doesn't mean that's wrong. That shit. I don't want to, you know, a lot of people want to give up their business when they have a bad day or a customer complaint or whatever. You know what? You could throw, throw 10 tons of shit at me and you could queue 5,000 critics outside of my door who are going to come into my house one by one and throw a load of fucking abuse at me. And I'll take it because I know I'm on the right path and nothing else I could do would be any better anyway. So I have these momentary fleeting feelings because I'm a human being. But I guess, you know, I'm pretty good at going to the gym when I don't feel like it because I know that afterwards I'll feel really good about myself. Like I'll yeah. finish this podcast and I'll have a little moment where I go, a little part of me wanted, wanted to cancel that. And I didn't. And I've done it. And my energy was good. I feel good about myself. And, you know, self-worth is kind of, making promises and commitments to yourself and then keeping them. And then when you make promises and commitments and don't keep them, that, that self-worth goes down. And in 15 years, I've probably canceled five meetings. Uh, yeah, do, you know, right. do you know what, Rob? You just, just answered. Yeah, you just, you know, when we said before we started this podcast, what, what we're calling it, you've just answered the question and we've got to see a glimpse of what you actually do. That I, for me, that's the first time to actually see, do you know what, this is what actually Rob does and all these decisions he's making and how you're making them. And even when you're feeling, you know, tired or, you know, or some things happen there, you're still mm. doing it. And we've just seen a glimpse of that. So yeah. for that, thank you. Obviously, you, you devote a lot of time, Rob, to in the pursuit of success, but how do you manage the, the whole work-life balance thing, or, or not so much work-life balance, but time with the family? Because you're on it all the time right so do you have certain hours where it's like no that's private time that's me time um that's something else <laughs> well, should, we be, should we be asking Gemma that one <laughs> yeah, that's, that's two minutes on my birthday that time uh, <laughs> um right so yeah look I, I have a i wrote a book called routine equals results which is essentially how to architect and design your life for the ideal routine, the ideal day, the ideal energy, the ideal balance. And I, I rarely break those rules. And I broke those rules for someone's 40th birthday who's a good friend, and I don't regret it. But I knew when I was going to have four hours sleep, that would affect my next two days. Yeah. So that's, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, Rob, your routine, you get coffee same time, you do everything at the same time, you're so rigid. But when I get four hours sleep, that really affects the next two days really you know and i so everything's a bit more about pulling myself through it so um i try and compartmentalize and you know make sure i have um some time with Gemma in the evening um mm -hmm. most nights if not every night although clubhouse and you know lockdown disrupted that because lockdown i had to double down because you do what you've got to do yeah um, yeah and the kids you know i always take bobby to golf and i take ariana to her um classes and things like that you know being quite honest i probably could spend more time with my kids i, I don't I don't really like, um, and I never decline an answer, I don't think ever on a podcast, but I, I don't really feel that comfortable talking about um, how I am as a dad because mm. I, I think I could spend more time with my kids. But the trade-off is um, I think my wife wants me to be a really successful entrepreneur. I think she's really grateful, you know, when I've provided a great life for us and built up a little empire. And at times I've dug us out of some shit when – you know, there's been recessions or pandemics oh. or, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, and, and I've just obsessed about getting us through those when other, other companies have gone on. I've seen so many companies over the last 15 years go by the wayside. Most of our competitors, I, I know, I can think of one other person 
who's been in the game as long as us in our industry are one and everyone's come and gone. And when it's got hard, I've just got done what needs to be done. And that's also part of being a dad is yeah. showing your kids what you're about. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, I tell my kids, you know, what to do all the time. And I try and tell them in a nice way and they, they never fucking listen to me. But when they, <laughs> they don't, they don't. But when they came to the super conference and saw 1,200 people and me standing on stage, they were both like, wow. Yeah. Daddy. Yeah. And when they saw my TikTok videos and all the views, they're like, daddy. Your video, <laughs> you know, 700,000 views on TikTok, daddy. So yeah. sometimes being a great parent is about showing your kids as well as, you know, yeah, reading stories and stuff like that. And and also, Gemma wants to be useful. So she, you know, she manages the house because that's a fucking full-time job managing our house. It is. Um, and she, you know, she manages the kids and that makes her feel valuable and useful. So I, I, I think, you know, if, if I were to search deep in my soul and I, I'd probably like to spend five hours a week more with my kids mm. um, and, and do a bit more varied stuff with them. But what's the point of beating myself up about that? Because the past is the past. And, uh, you know, I don't fuck around. I don't scroll on social media. I don't watch loads of shit on TV. I don't get involved in discussions, debates. and I don't waste time. I, I, I don't. And, and if I get drawn into something, I cut it out pretty quick. So yeah. the times I'm not spending with my kids, you know, like school is 27 grand a year. Plus that again for all the bloody drums and the violin. And the, <laughs> yeah. You know, and all and, Fuck, you know, stuff that wifey yeah. buys for them and all of that and someone's got to provide for all that and um that's my job and i feel useful and my wife's very independent i think if i had a, a needy wife there'd be a lot of tension um and i don't have a needy wife um sometimes maybe i'd like her to be a bit more needy you know but um <laughs> well between, between quarter to eight and quarter past eight according to opportunity exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but she's um she's very independent. She likes her own space to do her own thing, and that's probably good if you're married to an obsessive, disruptive entrepreneur. That's probably that probably works. But you yeah, know, when it comes when it comes to being a dad and a husband and a human being, I'm flawed. You know, I'm, I'm I don't really like giving advice on that just because yeah, you know, I'm no guru. I'm just doing the best I can. I, I know where I add value. Um. Yeah, but yeah. thank you for that. Uh, I, again, it, very honest, Rob. So, so I appreciate that. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to a, a kind of a TV type of question. You mentioned TV. So, in true undercover billionaire style, like Mr. Cardone, he, if you had to start all over again with just a hundred pounds in your pocket, a car, not a Ferrari, <laughs> a mobile phone with no contacts, but your knowledge, what would you do now, and why? I'd go and meet Mark Homer again. <laughs> Job done. Yeah. Okay, next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd go and hunt out people who knew what they were doing in the areas of business I wanted to get in, and I'd build relationships with them. I'd go to live networking events. That's where I met Mark Homer at a property networking event. So got no contacts. I'd figure out what property and business networking meetings were there, and I'd get networking with everyone, get there early, stay there late. That's exactly what I did and how I met Mark. Um, you know, everything comes through other people. Referrals, you, you know, cl clients are paying you money. That's through people and their decisions. Mm -hmm. Partnerships, joint ventures, collaborations, raising finance, the bank manager. Um, I just gave a multi-million pound personal guarantee yesterday. That two, two solicitors came to do that. So that came wow. through people. So, you know, everything's through people. So I'd go and um, meet and make relationships with people. And, and who is it that you uh, look up to or inspires you in the business world? Do you have um, anybody specific that you or a go-to set of people that you, you know, you, or do you currently have a mentor? Do you actually have a mentor? Yeah, I've had good, good mentors over the years. James Kahn, Andres Paniotu, John, uh, John Demartini, some absolutely legendary mentors. And um, yeah, so and I think having mentors is vital. You don't know what you don't know. We were having a, yeah. a we we're having a meeting where we had two and a half hours on discussion, com discussing commissions. And I got halfway through it and I thought, I just need to speak to someone who's got a hundred salespeople and just uh, throw these scenarios through them all. Cause they'll have most of the answers I haven't got. So, you know, it's smart to leverage the experience of, of other people. Um, I, look, I admire anyone in business who's 
taken a risk and has showed some courage to be disliked and ridiculed and gone out and done something meaningful in the world. So, you know, anyone who's successful, I, I admire their successful traits. When you said, is there any one particular person? There isn't really. Mm. I mean, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger, because of the multidisciplines, and I think he's got a brilliant attitude and, you know, how he loves America and what it's given for him. And he's almost so patriotic of a country yeah. even born in. And still to this day, he's got charisma and I, I, I think he's great. Obviously, Richard Branson has done so much for entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, Elon Musk is obviously, you know, but the the thing is, you have to be careful not to idolize these to the point where you compare yourself to them. I'm not Elon Musk. I'm not Richard Branson. I'm not Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, um, you know, I've got my own skills and talents and traits that I need to admire um, and respect and learn to, to love about myself. And, you know, I've met Arnold Schwarzenegger and spent quite a lot of time with him. And he's a human being like everyone else and a bit awkward yeah. meeting people like everyone else. And, um but I, I'll learn from anyone, you know, I learn from anyone above yeah. me, below yeah. me to the side. Yeah. So generally speaking, you know, we've been talking about business and, and, you know, and I think a lot of people, oh, when you have your own business is, is great and you've got all this X, Y, and Z. What do you think is a downside of running your own business? Well, first thing I'll say is there's a downside to everything. Yeah. And, um, Nothing has all upside or all downside. And wisdom is understanding the upside and the downside simultaneously in the moment. And when you say something is really good, you're only seeing all upside. When you say something is really bad, you're only seeing all downside. And that is usually fueled by emotion. When you transcend emotion and you seek to understand the upside and the downside simultaneously in any, dis any situation, then you probably have a higher level of wisdom or understanding and, uh, and solution focused. Um, so I did a little... Um, well, I did quite a big Zoom mastermind yesterday, but I did a little question, which is, um, right, currently in our training business, we have 80 staff. Um, so um, what's the upside of having 80 staff? And they went outsourcing, leveraging, delegating, you know, earning on all of them, the size of your company, you know, the scale, blah, blah, blah. Um, then I said, what's the downside of having 80 staff? And then they all came out, HR, management, <laughs> yeah. issues, you know, um, conflict, yada, yada. So whatever you look at, you can see um, equal upside and downside. So I just wanted to make that statement because I think it's the most important statement you can make because people have this utop utopic fantasy. When I solve that problem, everything will be great. You know, when I just when I just when that's done, uh, I'll, I'll be complete. Um, you know, once I've got rid of this problem, then I'm going to be this chilled out lifestyle entrepreneur. No, no, no. New level, new devil. And, you know, your reward for solving a problem is a bigger one. Yeah. And that's that's reality. And actually, it's not glass half empty and negative. It's actually positive because you go from problem to problem to problem with no loss of enthusiasm and grateful for each new level and each new problem. And when you do that, you don't wish them away. You don't hide from them and you scale the quickest. And then you get all the upside rewards, which is, of course, the mm -hmm. money and the notoriety. So anyway, can you ask the question again? I just wanted to make that as a sort of separate statement because I think it's vital. So do you think there's any, what is a downside of running a business? Uh, so a downside of running a business is um, there's so much responsibility yeah. placed squarely on you that mm. the feeling lonely, massive pressure and yeah. responsibility can catch you unawares. And I've had two or three instances in my life where if seemingly out of nowhere, I've just been absolutely overcome by loneliness or massive pressure and responsibility or, or um, yeah, just relentless pressure. Sure. Would you say entrepreneurialism is for everybody, Rob? Because there's I a lot of people. No, no, I, no I, it's and not, we don't buy it? this at all. I mean, I think, I think some people are more cut out to, to do it than others. Uh, as you say, there's a lot of downsides that come with it. Um, just think, yeah. That, yeah. Can it's not something you know, you, isn't it? Yeah, can everyone be an entrepreneur? Well, you can learn the skills and traits required. So I'd never say that, um, you know, most people can't be. Most people won't be. But most people won't be a Blackburn martial arts. Most people won't be a professional yeah. racing driver. Most people yeah. won't have more than a million followers on social media. So, mm. um, no, everything is not for everyone, including entrepreneurship. But um, mm. for me, would I rather have the downsides of entrepreneurship or the downsides of employment? I'll take the downsides of entrepreneurship every single day. <laughs> Whether this is somewhat stubbornness or whatever, but being told what to do by someone I don't want to be and I don't <laughs> admire 
is is the pain way worse than yeah. the challenges of being an entrepreneur. I need freedom and creativity to make fast decisions and make them happen. And um, but no, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. But I'll tell you what, the rewards are fucking brilliant as well. Like you can make millions and millions and millions and you pay tax last and you get to contribute massively and you get to create a product and service yourself and you see it, you know, born into the world like your own child. And then you see it scale. And, you know, when you build a team and you see energy and enthusiasm and gratitude within a team yeah. and an organization, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I'd agree. OK, so moving on to our quick fire trivia round. This is a bit more lighthearted. Um, it's a bit similar to Gary V's overrated, underrated, if you've ever seen that on uh, on social media. So we're going to give you two options and you just need to pick the one of the two that you prefer. So I'll kick this one off. Uh, Ferrari or Lamborghini? Lamborghini, easy. Classical or contemporary art? Modern. That, oh, okay. oh, blimey. <laughs> Me again. <laughs> well, contemporary because it's, yeah, I like modern. So I'll take contemporary. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, Gary V or Grant Cardone? Grant Cardone, he's my friend. Yeah. I, I don't know Gary V um, as well as Grant. Grant's my friend, Grant Cardone. Nothing against okay. Gary, but I know Grant. Yeah. Pool or snooker? Uh, pool, because I'm better at it. Okay. Although I am interviewing Ronnie O'Sullivan next week, so that'd be cool. <laughs> McDonald's or KFC? Neither. Phil. Really? Phil. Filth. Oh, filth. Interesting filth. because of all the people we've asked, most people have opted successful entrepreneurs have opted for KFC. So well, I don't know if there's yeah, something I mean, in that. I'd probably, I, if I had to choose, I'd probably go McDonald's. Um, yeah, but I, yeah, because maybe a bit more variety on the menu, I could choose something. But um, and my kids, yeah, prefer, my kids, <laughs> my kids prefer McDonald's. So yeah. Okay. Um, Alexander McQueen or Balenciaga. Oh, McQueen. Alexander uh, McQueen or anyone in fashion ever? Alexander yeah. McQueen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Protect Fleet or Audemars Piguet? Um, I would have said AP a few years ago. I love AP and I love the brand. And, uh, you know, I've, I've met the, the CEO and I've been over there a couple of times. Um, but I'm going to say Patek because the Nautilus, they've done something amazing with the Nautilus. And, um, yeah, Patek. What was somebody saying to us about the Rolex, the, um, you know, being on the metals that they're, they're going to oh, go Oh, really yeah, apparently the, the stainless ones, because they're stopping production of them, the stainless ones are going through the roof price-wise at the moment, or will do in, for investment purposes. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of bubble in the watch market, but then it is where it is. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of upward price movement in, um, in these watches, but I, I don't know, I'm a bit old school in the... Um, I don't want to pay 15, 20 grand for a Batman or a Pepsi yeah. or a whatever. Daytona's are far more proven in the sports market. I mean, Nautilus have gone crazy from Patek. I I'm waiting till it drops before I go in. I sold out and made quite a lot of money on a lot of my watches. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like there has to be a correction somewhere. Yeah. It reached me at another level. Um, yeah. A bit, bit, a bit crazy, but um, I've seen this before. And I've also seen the drop before. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. I don't know why I've got this one. Blonde or brunette, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> Think carefully are you, now. Are you fucking struggling for questions when you got to this one? I don't know, but the, I've got the, this the one. The next one was shaven or unshaven. You don't want to know. Um, but, but for legal reasons, I was told to remove that. <laughs> right. Um, whatever whatever hair color my wife sports at the time. That, no. Okay. Um, I no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the game. I'm going to play the game. Um, and I've told this to my wife. She's dyed, dyed her hair dark before, and she looks beautiful with dark hair, as she does with blonde hair. But a dark hair, yeah, a probably dark hair, yeah. Okay. Um, I think we already know the answer to this one. one. Alcohol or soft drink? Um, yeah, soft drink. I don't drink. Maybe, don't maybe drink I, have, I have one cocktail maybe two or three times a year just to celebrate something. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm I'm two, three drinks a year, so you could, that's pretty much not, isn't it? Um, yeah. So, yes, a soft drink. Clubhouse or Facebook? Clubhouse. Yeah. yeah. Physical or audio book? Audio. I don't think I've read a book for a long time. Um, yeah. Audio is so convenient, yeah. Do you think that, um, again, another trait we're seeing is a lot of successful people are avid readers or listeners to e-books, um, constantly learning and, and gleaning knowledge from, would you say that's something that you, you tend to do? I mean, do you yeah. consume books regularly? 
this year not so much because clubhouse has taken all, all that time up because i've really yeah. jumped in on that all in but yeah i mean at one point i was listening to 100 plus books a year yeah okay, okay. and just a couple of personal questions before we before we end uh, you mentioned your, your children um what what are you doing with them now to educate are you educating them what you're doing in the business is there anything you're doing you know specifically with them to you know from an entrepreneurship perspective yeah a little bit but um i don't know part of me thinks the best way for a child to learn is to watch uh -huh. you um yes because, because you know you know you can tell them to stop swearing never swear never swear never swear and the one time you blur out buck is that when mm -hmm. they blur out yeah buck. yeah yeah so um you know them seeing what i do i took them around 100 you were marked around 100 unit development and they loved it and getting them a bit more involved in what i do going to events being part of that world i personally think that's the best way to teach them because what i found with my kids is 99 percent of the time when i try and teach them they don't listen mm. and I don't, i'm not the only you know and i, I, I try and work no, no, no. a lot around getting them in that environment to listen so and especially you know my son's probably a lot like me and he's, he's quite stubborn um, so look, I've got them learning about money and counting money really early. I get them, give them incentives to win money by, you know, performing at certain things. Um, you know, I got my son listening to personal development in the car with me when he was young. Um, so bits and bobs. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, what, what's his, the book, the really good, um, was it Matthew Syed or, um, but, or was it Steve Peters that wrote, uh, a personal development book for kids i forget but the, yeah. the kids listen to that uh but i don't know I, I naively thought before my kids were born i could teach them everything that I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're going to be billionaires and they're going to be world champions <laughs> and uh yeah you know your kids teach you as much as you teach them and yeah. um yeah i'm more i'm now more into showing rather than telling Brilliant. Okay. So you're a big vinyl enthusiast. What what sort of music do you listen to? And what is it specifically about vinyl as a as a media that you you know you love when compared to sort of more modern formats? Okay, so I love all types of music and I especially love recordings that sound really good. So I'm looking over there. Seal's first album mm -hmm. sounds unbelievable on a good hi-fi. And I'm looking over there and I've got Rammstein, which sounds unbelievable <laughs> on a good hi-fi. So I've got a really eclectic taste. If I had a go to, it would probably be progressive rock or metal. So yeah. Radiohead, Porcupine Tree, um, that, that carnival, those kind of, they're not very well known. Radiohead are quite well known, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but I, I like progressive experimental rock and I like metal because it just gets me really, really supercharged. I can listen to Pantera or Ice T has, I've agreed Ice T for my podcast and he has a, um, metal band called body count and it's just ang like rage against the machine you know angry <laughs> aggressive uh, rah, you know like I don't let anyone get in my way kind of music i really love um but i would now be driven by the quality of the recording because yeah. it's a you know, really good experience and um, why vinyl um because it sounds better than digital sources mm. i mean because vinyl is an inconvenient medium one yeah. little one little wrong move when you take it you scratch it and then you've ruined yeah. it and of course you can listen to between one and four songs or maybe five or six per side and yeah. then you have to turn it over but you know i have a record deck there that's with the cartridge probably 45 50 grand and that will be every single digital source in fact i could probably have a 15 grand um turntable and cartridge and that will be every single digital source even if you spent 50 or 100 grand yeah um, i've got pretty much one of the best dax that um has been made to um convert um you know online digital sound i have um tidal instead of just itunes so highest quality recordings and it sounds shit compared to mine yeah. comparison yeah you know but okay. you know look i mean I've got a Panamera Turbo S and that's got a Burmester Hi-Fi in it. And that actually sounds quite good. Um, but yeah, vinyl just, it, it just sounds so much better. Yeah. How, how much is enough for you then, Rob? And, and when are you going to ever take a back seat or are you just going to work till you, you know, physically can't work no more? <laughs> well, uh, all this thing about um, it will be enough when it's just a fantasy. Mm. 
because evolution doesn't want us to all stop because if we all stopped we would you know one generation and we'd all be dead um yeah. you know it, it, evolution requires us to grow to evolve um you know it's not the strongest but the most adaptable to change that, that survive in business in life so there is no end there's evolution hmm. and a lot of people struggle with when does it end and i think that's when they're in a hamster wheel if you're in a hamster wheel you that would drive you insane thinking this is yes. never going to end mm -hmm. but if you're in a creative endeavor a valuable endeavor you're doing something that you love and you love what you do why would you want it to end i don't want this to end yeah. I, don't, I don't want today tomorrow to be like today that was like yesterday for me that's that is death itself i know that i've got 50 60 whatever many years i've got left doing cool and interesting shit as an entrepreneur why would i want that to ever end i don't want that to ever end and that's exciting bring it on right so so what does the future hold for rob moore is there anything exciting in the pipeline you can tell us any more books are you going to be on dragon's den are you going to be in america what does the future hold for rob moore well i can't predict the future so i can't tell you what's go what is in the future Damn, I thought um, you could. <laughs> yeah i'm i'm not going to be on dragon's den because i don't regard myself as a, a you know a good investor in companies it's not something i'm that mark and i buy companies for ourselves or start them up so i i i'm pretty sure i could have got on dragon's den i they tried to get me a lot on secret millionaire how the other half live rich house poor house i turned them all down because I want to do something a bit more individual with my brand. Yeah. Um, and, and that'll come. And I'm, I'm pleased that I've been patient on that because normally I like to just get in the media and get exposure. But um, time will tell with that. I've had a few things in the pipeline, one big thing, but it got cut because of uh, COVID. Yeah. But something yeah. will happen in that regard. Um, but, but for now, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing, writing books and inspiring and educating as many people on the planet to start and scale their business and get better financial knowledge i want to keep growing my foundation which helps young and underprivileged people start meaningful businesses that change the world and you know through my podcasts and books and training companies and uh, that that's they're, they're the media and the the vehicles by which i get mm -hmm. to do that so you know cool speaking gigs opportunities collaborations partnerships grow my personal brand globally all that stuff's on the table but um, I'm not too set in stone about that mm. because otherwise then it would it, it wouldn't be um you know that book my book opportunity you've got there part mm. of it is planning but part of it is embracing the opportunity that comes if I'd over planned on Facebook I wouldn't have embraced Clubhouse exactly I yeah. mean COVID was you know I guess a, 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 and the the launch of Clubhouse coincided it, the timing was perfect right yeah yeah so yeah you just don't know what's around the corner totally no agree. no you, you, you don't you, know what you don't know yeah you don't. <laughs> you don't and you got to be ready for what you can't plan for which mm. means you know bruce lee says be like water and so i like to think i can dance and react to, to whatever happens and see and seize the opportunity um and some of those things i'm clear about what they will be and some mm. of those things i have faith that something will come like you said for example uh, don't you want to be on dragon's den no i want to be on the new thing that's in line with what i'm about which is a replacement of Dragon's Den or is its own thing. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, that's, I, I'm not a professional investor. Yeah. You know, I, I could get on there and then pretend to invest in companies and say I'm out all the time. Yes. Um, or yeah. say I'm in and then not do the deal behind the cameras. But there's no integrity in that. But starting up entrepreneurs or going to developing world and, and helping create and breed the next level of entrepreneurs or, um, stuff, stuff. I could really see myself doing stuff like that. Wow. Yeah. You know, the right thing will come. Great. Good answer. Okay. So thanks again, Rob, for joining us today. Again, your energy and positivity is truly inspiring as always. Yeah. Thank and if, you and if, people, if people want to follow you, and I know you're everywhere, but where <laughs> should they go in particular? Should they be on Clubhouse? Where can they find you in your rooms? Like, where's the best place to go and find you now here today? Well, the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast is a good place. I'm nearly okay. 700 episodes in. I'm just talking about getting Floyd Mayweather for the second time. Ice-T, wow. Ronnie O'Sullivan, I'm interviewing next week. So I've got some cool 15 billionaires. I've just been connected up with my 16th as we speak. So the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast is a really okay. good place. I do a lot of unique content there that you don't get on socials. But other than that, I'm on all socials, at Rob Moore or at Rob Moore Progressive. You can find me on 
or socials. Lovely. Thank you. So again, thanks, Rob. You've been amazing. And thank you. And let me just say a shout out to both of you. It's been a pleasure to work with you over the years. Um, oh, thank you. Likewise. You guys are proper hustlers. And um, your uh, Back to Business podcast is a podcast that everyone should subscribe to. Um, and if you want any help in the sort of digital marketing type world, the web mm -hmm. online world, um, uh, make sure that you um, reach out to Kurt and die. Thank you. Oh, thank thanks. you. So thanks again. I've been Kurt. And I've been Di. Thanks for listening. And if you found this useful, then make sure you subscribe to the Back to Business podcast. All right. Now I'm going.